I called what? Okay. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our session this afternoon. I must say it's truly a pleasure that you could join with us to take some time out of your busy schedule, maybe having your little lunch, to join with us as we talk about giant African snail. Now, to many, this is a very popular topic, and from all the comments that we received over the past few days, we are seeing over 100 comments and over 600 shares. That means this is a very topical issue. So I hope that at the end of this session, you will be able to be more aware of how to manage giant African snails. For many of you all who actually made comments and had concerns and things like that, what I tried to do was create this presentation to answer your questions. So at the end of the session, your questions will be answered, right? So I ask you all to continue to tune on and as we go through this session. Now, this session is slightly different from the others in that it is not going to be sugar-coated with anything because, like I said, I use the comments that you all sent and use that as the guide to actually come up with this presentation. So it is going to answer all your questions. So just give me one second to share my screen and we'll continue. Okay, so like we said, we are going to talk about giant African snail. Come on. Okay, so we are going to talk, like I said, about management of giant African snail in Trinidad. Now, for those who have been following our, our um, sessions, you will see a number of our colleagues actually came and spoke about different pest issues that we have in our country. So giant African snail is just another one of those. <coughs> now, giant African snail has been here for a number of years. So we have reached a stage where we are managing the problem as compared to what people are saying we should eradicate. And we'll explain it a little later <coughs> as we go along. Now, the thing is, we also have a hotline and you're going to on the page here you'll see our hotline and also our um, email address should you um, require any other further information. So my outline for today's session includes, so these are some of the things that we'll be covering, approaches to managing giant African snail. And now you will see in the presentation we say gas, it's short for giant African snail. We'll be talking about methods of disposing dead snail. And that's something I'm stressing, dead snails. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. We will also be dealing with what is the ministry doing to assist with the problem? Where can you find information and training? And for the newcomers who don't know anything about giant African snail, we'll be talking a little bit about the identification of it. But like I said from the beginning, most of our comments came from people who know what the snail is about. They know what it looks like and things like that. For those who don't know what we are talking about, this is what giant African snail looks like. This is actually one in the field, and next to it is actually the eggs. So if you look at it, the coloration of the snail is completely different from our local snails. And we'll mention a little bit a little later about those things. So the first thing and most important, do not handle giant African snails with your bare hands. Very simple. Do not handle it with your bare hands. You can either use disposable gloves, pl a plastic bag, put your hand in a plastic bag, or even use tools, shovel or something like that to pick up the snail, but do not touch it with your bare hands. How are you going to manage this giant African snail? Now, from the comments, I'm seeing a lot of people using a number of remedies, and then they are complaining it is not working. These remedies or these approaches that I'm going to mention to you all have been tested and proven to work. So once you follow these guidelines, it will work and you will be able to bring your pest population down to a very low level. So you have two approaches. You have your chemical approach and then you have your non-chemical approach. So when we are talking about chemical approach, 
we are referring to bait in the area or purchasing bait. It is called snail and slug bait. Now the active ingredient in your snail and slug bait, bait is metaldehyde, right? Someone in one of the comments asked if this approach will work for slugs. Yes, it will. So it's snail and slug bait. The active ingredient is metaldehyde. If you choose not to use the bait and you do find another product on the market, just remember on the packaging, it must say it is a molluscicide, right? Now, you cannot, an insecticide will work for insects. A fungicide will work for fungus. You cannot use an insecticide to control snails. It will not, it will not work, right? So the packaging must say it is for snails and slugs. If you choose not to use chemicals in that regard, you can also use iron phosphate. It's also a product that you can get at the agro shops, which you can actually use to control snails, right? If you choose not to do the chemical approach, you can do what we call the non-chemical approach. And what that means is you can collect your snails and drown them in a salt solution, or you can drown them in a bleach solution. So it's that simple. The chemical approach or the non-chemical approach. So a little more in depth in terms of the chemical approach. So you are going to broadcast metaldehyde bait. Now the thing is, if you have pets around, you may not want to apply this metaldehyde bait because it could be harmful to your pets. So the alternative will be using iron phosphate. And you're going to do the same thing where you're broadcasting. Broadcasting means you're just sprinkling it around the area. Now, you're not going to make a thick layer around your area. It's broadcasting, you're just sprinkling it around, right? So that is why some people are concerned that they have to use too much bait more than likely you are just, you are using it the wrong way, right? You just have to sparsely sprinkle it around your area. And this bait has an attractant in it that will attract snails from wherever they are hiding. They will come and they will feed on the bait and they will die. Now, once you're using a insect, once you're using a chemical, sorry, you follow the manufacturer's recommendation. They will tell you the rates and things like that. And also use your protective gears meaning put your hands in a glove, have a, at least a respirator on, or goggles, because you never know you can get um, contact with those um, chemicals might get into your body and things like that, right? So you broadcast your bait or your iron phosphate. If you choose to do that, you, it, you can do it. The second approach is you can actually take those bait and mix it with your vegetable peelings, fruit peelings, scraps, and those type of things and actually put heaps around your area. So little heaps around, that will also attract them to come and feed on the material and also feed on your bait. And you can also make barriers as well. So you let's say you have a vacant lot next to your land, next to your house, and no one is tending to it. You can actually set up a barrier along your fence with your product, meaning your metallehyde, or your um, iron phosphate, and they will actually come there and feed on it and they will die. So they will not come onto your premises. Or you can even make this trap for this um, user's bait in the vacant lot. So they will come out in there and they will consume it and they will die over there, right? So you can broadcast your bait or your iron phosphate. <clears throat> the non-chemical approach is where you're going to use home remedies. Simple thing, normal cooking salt two cups of salt in one gallon of water. Normal pipe borne water, four liters, same thing, or two cups of bleach in a gallon of water. You are not mixing salt and bleach together. It is either or, whichever one is suited to you, either the salt or bleach, you mix it in a solution, and the method after is you collect your snails, and you submerge them in either of the solutions, you cover the container and you are leaving it for a minimum of 24 hours. After 24 hours has passed, snails will drown and they will die. That's it. There's nothing else you need to do. So like I said, the chemical approach, using your bait 
or the non-chemical approach, either using your salt solution or your bleach solution. <clears throat> From the comments, we have a lot of people saying they are sprinkling salt on the snail and the snails are not dying. Ministry is recommending that you make a salt solution, right? Because once you sprinkle salt on a live snail, it goes back into its shell. That's its protective home or its protective covering. So the snail will not get in contact with the salt or the bleach and they will not die. But if you make a salt solution and you actually put them in that container, they will get this, this, the um, effects of the solution and they will die. So it is not that the salt is not working. It is how you are applying salt or the bleach. So that is why I have a, a list of don'ts because a lot there was a lot of discussion on um, our Facebook page about things that working and what not working, right? So don't sprinkle salt on live crawling snails. You collect them, you put them in a salt solution and they will die. Don't sprinkle bleach on live crawling snails, right? Another topical one is people are saying they are lighting the snails afire. They are, they are lighting them, burning them alive. Now, please understand we are in the fire season. You are not supposed to be lighting fires outside and things like that, right? So do not light snails a, a, a fire, right? Because the thing is, just imagine a snail is on fire. It will still continue to crawl. It could get into your homes, maybe your shed where you have stuff that you're stored, that you're storing. It can cause even more damage. So do not light snails up, right? Next thing is, do not use things like kerosene and gas on snails. When those things actually fall on your land, it also damages the soil, right? So you do not want to be using those type of products. Do not bury live snails. A lot of people say they will just collect the snail, dig a hole and bury it. The snail lives in the soil, so it will just come out back, right? So doing that serves no purpose. Don't collect your live snails and dump it in the waterways or in a vacant lot. A lot of people continue to do that. They collect the snails from their property and they throw it in the drain next to their house or they throw it in the neighbor's property and things like that. These are not far-fetched things that I'm saying because a lot of people say they do it. And then they complain that they are not getting a control over the snail. It is because what you are doing. The snails must be killed before you can actually dispose of it. Some people try to rear things as pets. Snails is not something that you want to rear as a pet, right? You want to make sure and actually kill them, right? Now, if it is, let's say you have a water, a waterway near to your area, let's say a river, a stream and things like that. If upstream people are not managing a snail, yes, it will continue to come down in your area. So, and later on, I'll tell you some of the things you can do but it's like a team effort, right? It is not one person trying to control this alone. It's a community must get together and try to deal with this. And the most important thing, I have it in red here, do not eat giant African snail. A lot of people are talking about in Africa that with the rare snails and they consume it, yes. In Trinidad, our snails has a, something called a rat lungworm in it. And that is linked to meningitis. If you do not cook the snail properly and things like that, you are actually going to get that into your system and it can make you sick. So do not eat the snail. Another thing is if you are baiting the snail, meaning if the snails are actually consuming metaldehyde and then you eat that, you can also injure yourself. So do not eat giant African snails. So once you kill a snail, like I said, if you either use your chemical approach or you use your um, natural, your non-chemical approaches, your snails will be dead. Again, we are saying even though if they are dead, do not handle them with your bare hands, right? You collect them, use a shovel, like I said before, or you use gloves, you collect them. You can, when they are dead, if it is safe, you have a safe area, let's say a hole or something like that, you can burn them. I know a lot of people have these metal drums behind their house where they burn material leaves and things like that. It's a safe environment. You can put it there and burn your stuff. 
Now, as you could see in my presentation there, I have the fire season starts from December 1st and ends on the 30th, 30th of June. So we are in the fire season. So you cannot be lighting open flames. So the other options you are you need to follow do not light fires. I'm sure we have been passing throughout the, our country and you will see so many areas are being destroyed by fires. Some deliberately set and some people started the fire and it just got out of hand, right? So do not set fires. If you cannot, like we say, we are in the fire season, so if you cannot burn your snails, the other thing, option will be to bury dead snails. So we said if you bait your area and the snails are dead, or you put them in the solution and they are dead, those are the snails that you can bury. How deep? At least two feet deep. Reason for that is because the snails are going to rot. So you need to make sure that they are buried deep enough so you don't get that scent. And if it is, you, let's say you live in a concrete jungle and you don't have soil to bury snails, you can even bag your dead snails and put them in the garbage and allow them to <coughs> burn it down. But they must be dead. Because if you put them in live snails in a bag, they will feed by through the bag and come out again. Right? So it has to be dead snails to dispose. So this is just some pictures to show you what I've been talking about. So when we say broadcast your bait, this is what we mean. It's just a sprinkling of the bait, not a thick layer on the area. And next to it as well, you see this makeshift container where it's a metal barrel where they actually cut a hole in it where they can put the, um, the fuel, in this case the wood, to burn and then you will dump your, sna your dead snails in there. And it's safe. The fire is contained and it will not spread and cause further damage. So you can find creative ways of actually burning your snails when we are out of the fire season. But for now, we cannot be, like I said, doing open flames. To answer some of people's some questions about um, vacant lots. Now, the thing is, we have a lot of abandoned estates, lands throughout our country. They will fall under these categories. They can be privately owned, they can be agricultural state lands, or they can fall under the regional corporation. Depending on which it falls under, that is the um, section or that is the person that you need to deal with, right? Now, most of the time, if you go to those, air, those let's say, state lands section or whatever, they will tell you they, there's very little they could do. Let's say you go to your neighbor property and they decide they are not going to clean the area or manage the snail. What do you do? Well, then you use it to your advantage and do it, like I say, um, your self project. Basically, you're going to do it yourself. You try to clean the area if you could. And if not, like I mentioned before, you just set up this bait or this bait trap with your vegetable peelings and things like that on that property or close to your property. And snails will come out, they will feed on the um, bait and they will die. Right, so don't, it's not that saying how there's nothing you can do. You can protect your area by just creating that border with your snail bait. On a side note, the Ministry of Agriculture has moved away from this eradication approach where we used to go out and bait areas, collect snails, do site visits and things like that. We are no longer doing that. Right, because a lot of comments are also on that. Why can't we do certain things? So please note, no side visits is being conducted again for giant African snail. So even if you call your ministry's offices and you're telling them to come out and do visits, they cannot do that again, right? They are so swamped with other activities, they will not be coming out to deal with giant African snail. No, the ministry is not baiting any areas for giant African snail. And the ministry is not supplying bait to any person, group, or community. It's up to the community, up to the person, up to the group to pool together their resources and manage giant African snail on their own. So what is the ministry doing? Now the thing is, because, and I have this very important point here, a lot of times when our hotline was working, we get a lot of abuse, even in the counties. People call and they ridicule those who are answering the phone about giant African snail and the worst of things they will tell them on the phone. We need to understand that we work for the government and we are guided by legislation 
and protocol. That is what we follow. We don't just decide to do what we want when we want it. So if you research about any pest, the first thing that you need to realize, or you will know, it when it gets into an area, we, they try to contain it in that area, or what you call the core area, and eradicate it. This was done for 10 years. The ministry contained it in the Digo Martin area when it was found in 2008 until 2018, right? It was contained in that area. Baiting took place and they were on a mode of eradication. But once it gets out of that core area, then it goes into a management mode. And that is exactly what happened because of the weather conditions, because people weren't following the ministry's guidelines then by not moving soil and moving plants out of the area. These snails moved out of the core area and to date it has spread to almost every part of Trinidad. So in a case like that, now it is spread throughout the country. We are in a management mode. When we were actually in that eradication phase in just that core area, that Dago Martin area, it costed the ministry an estimated of $2 million per year to try to get rid of the snail. So just check that for 10 years at $2 million, the amount of money that was spent to try to eradicate the snail. In our case, uh, the case like what we have now, we do not have the resources to go out and manage giant African snail. Our entire government's budget will go into that and still it will not be enough. So we are asking public groups to get together and try as best as possible to manage the snail issue themselves. Everything we do is based on our government policies and our ministry's action plan. What the ministry is doing, and like what I'm doing today, I am disseminating the information, the correct information. So you're not going and using home remedies and mixing a number of things together. We are telling you exactly what to do and how to do it. Once you follow those guidelines, you are able to manage your snail problem. And I keep saying managing the problem eh? because, like I said, we have moved beyond the core area, so we cannot eradicate the snail problem from our country. Anywhere in the world that you look, you do research about giant African snail or any pest, after a period of time, once it leaves the core area, hardly likely you are able to actually eradicate it. So you have to manage the problem. In terms of training, even though we are still following COVID regulations and things like that. We can still do training virtually for groups. You can get together, you can contact us, and we can also do training on how to manage this problem. So we are there still disseminating information. Even if you call our hotline or any of our county offices, they will tell you the same thing, that how we go about to manage the snail. On the issue of the hotline, because some people were reporting that they've been calling the line and they are not getting through. I'm telling you today again, as I did in my last presentation, our phones has been down since November of last year. It's March now, and we do not have a phone line. So you've been trying. It's not that the ministry workers are not working, because I know that's the first thing that we will say, workers, ministry people are not working. Our phone lines are down since November, so we are not taking, we are not getting any of your calls. Our email address is still up, but we also have um, internet issues. A lot of times we have no internet on our station. So when we do have internet, we respond back to you with some management um, strategies that you can use. So this is just some pictures showing we continue to do training when we were doing um, physically, but we can also do virtually. So you can contact us and we can arrange for that as well. <clears throat> now I'm, as I go through, I'm seeing comments there. People are talking about boiling the snail and things like that. Like I say, you don't have to go through all that. Those are inhumane ways of dealing with the snail, number one. We are showing you the basic things that you can do. Bait your area or collect your snail and drown them in a salt solution or a bleach solution. If it is you decide you want to um, get further information, you can visit our ministry's website, agriculture.gov.tt. You can even visit our um, Facebook page as you are doing right now. 
contact your county office, you can contact your research division, or you can even send your um, concerns to snailreport at gmail.com. Now, I know it is a serious problem with people who actually have a lot of um, produce out there and snails are feeding on them and things like that. But I'm telling you because we have seen it before. Once people bait the area properly, they are able to bring this pest population down to a very low level. So just for those who are unfamiliar with what it looks like and things like that, it's a brown snail with cream to yellow stripes running in one direction from the tip of the shell to the head. And I'll show you what it looks like in the pictures. Um, the shell usually has seven or more whorls. I'll show you what that looks like. And it also has a truncated columnar. So this is what we mean um, when we talk about this um, truncated columnar, it is actually like a hook at the underneath of the snail shell, right? Compared to our local snails where you don't have that hook, it is smooth. The whorls, um, basically it's on, on your shell, you will see the different sections. So if you look at the tip, there's different sizes of that shell. That section is called a whorl. So the thing is, those are some of the other features that you need to, that you will see. Right, but the most important thing is the coloration. That brown snail with cream to yellow stripes. So if you look at them here now, the snail with the brown, the brown snail, that's a giant African snail, and the one that is next to it is a local snail that we have. So you can't mistake them. The local snail from a giant African snail. Now the thing about giant African snail, they multiply so fast that you will see them more than anything. Hardly you are seeing our local snails, right? So once you have a number of snails in an area, more than likely it is giant African snail. Again, comparing it. Now this is, if you look at um, the snail on, well, it's my right. That snail where you see that, a, a black X on its shell, that is closely, it closely looks like our giant African snail, but that is also a local snail. So again, by just looking at the shell, you can know whether it's giant African snail or if it is our local snails. <clears throat> Our giant African snail can get very large, more than almost eight um, inches, right? This is if you look at for those who have their pens in front of them, you will look at the size of your pen and look at this. That will tell you the size of that, how big a snail could get. And it can live for almost nine years. So that is why I say giant African snail is very difficult to eradicate once it gets into an area. Something very important, life cycle of this snail. Because a lot of people, they bait the area and they said they are not able to control the snail. Things that, that um, basically what is happening is you get, you are getting different generations of the snail. So the picture is showing you here when the eggs are laid in about two weeks time, usually about eight to 12 days, these eggs hatch into what we call the juveniles and they continue, they start to feed. And in five months time, these juveniles become sexually mature so that they will start to produce their own eggs and the cycle takes place. So in a case like that, you need to bait your area every two weeks. Once you keep doing that, you are able to actually bring down the population to a very low level. Now, giant African snail, they are hermaphrodites, meaning that all the snails will produce eggs. They have both male and female um, parts in them. One snail, could produce between 100 to 400 eggs in a cycle. And usually they have about three to four cycles per year. So just imagine you have one giant African snail producing 1,200 eggs in a year. That is tell you why we are not able to eradicate the snail. That is why a lot of people are complaining. They can't get rid of the snail. The thing is you can't get rid of all the snails at one time because you may have some adults feeding, you may have some juveniles crawling around, you may have some eggs in your soil. So you have to actually continuously do your baiting so that you're able to get all the generations. Now the dry season is the best time to get rid of the snail because you are hardly will get them all over the place because there's little moisture. So they will be hiding in cool, dry, cool moist areas. So you can set up your traps in those areas and you're able to get them as well. Right? We don't want to wait for the rainy season when we have a upsurge of it again. So your baiting should be done every two weeks. 
uh, where you find these snails, like I said, in moist areas, you can find them anyway, basically, because of the numbers. This picture is just showing you on a wall with some plants, just keeping the area cool. You actually have them on the wall. You can have them in areas anywhere you have garbage, because this snail actually feeds on um, decaying matter before it actually could get onto your vegetables and or live matter. So anywhere you have, in local terms, we say rubbish, or anywhere you have material that is rotten, you're sure to find your snails there. So what you need to do, you need to clean up your area so to prevent them from actually continuing to multiply in that area. Because if there's a food source, they will continue to multiply even faster. All right, so just our contact information again. Like I said, our phone lines have been down for some time now, but when it is up again, hopefully, you will still be able to contact you all, but you can still send your concerns via Gmail, snailreport at gmail.com. Right, but like I'm saying, whether you call our hotline, whether you email us, whether you contact the county offices, they will tell you the same thing. How to manage the snail by yourself, right? You have to manage it. You have to buy your own bait. You have to buy your own salt or your bleach, make your solution, collect your snails, and um, continue the procedure. So you might think it is all gloom and doom. It is not. Now I have something as a positive note here. I might say giant African snail is here to stay. It should, that is not something positive. It is not positive. But the thing is, it is not that we don't know how to deal with it. So the ministry, as I have explained to you, we are telling you exactly how to deal with the issue. It is up to you to do it. So you can either complain or you can work together with a group, let's say your neighbors in your community and manage this problem in your area. No one is telling you to go and bait someone else's property. No one is telling you to go in the savannah and bait the area or collect snails. If you want to do that, that is all well and good. No one is telling you to go and bait someone else's field. All we are saying, deal with your area, your property, and if everyone deals with their property, we'll be able to bring the population down to a very low level. Now, something I'm throwing out to you all, we are all very creative people, Trinidadians, we are creative people. Someone could find a way of actually using the snail, and I don't mean eating it, right? Our, the shell of this snail is very beautiful. Maybe we can find some craft method of actually using it, make, make, making some ornamental something. So if we create a little, let's say a cottage industry or whatever, we wouldn't, may not even have enough snail to actually um, use in these industries. So I'm sure we could find some creative ways of actually using the snail shell at least. And most important for those who have been following our, se our um, sessions before, a lot of my colleagues before and even those that will come after will be talking about awareness sessions, about pests that just on the borders of our country, meaning on the outside, where we hope not to enter our country, right? And this is how giant African snail came into our country. Someone deliberately brought it into our country, right? That is why we go with the slogan, do not pack a pest. You may travel, you may see a nice fruit, a flower, a plant, a branch, whatever it is. You might think, okay, I can hide it in my suitcase and bring it into the country. Physically, you may not see what is on it. It may not have the physical pest on it, but it will have what we call the nymph stage or the young stage of the pest, or it could have spores of a fungus. It could have eggs of a pest. You bring that into our country. You do not declare it you plant it or you throw it out of your window, whatever it is, they start to multiply and then we have this problem. Like I told you, we were trying to manage this problem for 10 years, spending over $20 million. Could you imagine what $20 million could have been used for? We had to try to manage giant African snail, right? So do not pack a pest. Do not bring in things that we don't have in our country. So thank you all very much for tuning on to us and viewing us for these few minutes. I hope I was able to share some light into how to manage giant African snail. And like I said, it's not new information. I've been doing this for a number of years and my colleagues in the counties and other sections of the ministry have also been 
um, saying this over and over and over. Bathe your area or make your solution with salt or bleach, collect your snails, drown them, and we're able to reduce the population of snails. So I hope I was able to answer most of your questions. One other, one another question um, I have, and then we'll go through this, um, some of the other questions to that people are now posting. Someone was saying how the issue with consuming vegetables or fruits that may that snail may have passed on to, on it. Now, number one, eggs are not only produced. So the snail doesn't lay eggs on your produce, so you don't have that to worry about. But if it is, let's say you have, let's say the slime goes on your produce, consuming that, you will not um, get sick or anything like that. But as a general rule, once you have your produce and you have to consume them or cook them and things like that, you need to wash them. And it's always a good term that um, a rule that you use either white vinegar or bleach in some water wash your produce and then you consume it. So usually we recommend using two to three tablespoons of bleach or vinegar in normal tap water. You wash your vegetables or your fruits, your leafy vegetables, those type of things, and then you consume it. So that's a little safeguard that you can actually do as well. So I'll go through some of the questions as well for the few things that I didn't um, touch on. And like I say, we have you can still after this presentation. You can still send your comments and we will try as best as possible to answer them. Thank you again. Yeah. OK, so I'm going to try to answer some of the questions. So um, someone is asking if you can reuse the salt solution. Now, yes, you can reuse it. Now, if you soak, and again, when, once you get the experience, you will realize you, that you can't really reuse it. Eh? Because if you soak your snails in the, in the salt solution, after 24 hours and you remove the snail, you will realize that the um, number one, the solution is very um, dirty looking, so it turns almost brown. And then to this concentration of the solution will die out after a while. So it's not really recommended. It is not as potent as, as it will be that when you have made when you made a solution. So it's not really recommended that you reuse the solution. Another thing is when the snails are dying, they will actually secrete the eggs. The eggs will also be killed or the, the life of the egg will also be destroyed in the solution. So pouring the solution into your drain and thing on onto the land after is not a problem, right? You are still able to get rid um, you will kill the adults, you will kill the juveniles and also the eggs. Right, so you can actually, that is why we say the salt solution is so important. Now, yes, we know um, in terms of the meat and things like that, the um, the protein level and those type of things are important, but like we're saying, do not eat the snail. We cannot eat our snail. Routinely, we collect snails and we actually test it and it still has that rat along worm in it. So it is not recommended that you actually eat the snail. Okay. Right. Now, some people like they're saying they are asking how to get rid of the eggs. Like we are saying, how once you keep collecting your adults, little by little, you will be re indirectly you are reducing the number of eggs that you have in the environment. If you, like I said, if it is also you find other products that may work for the eggs, you are free to use it. Once it says it will work for snails and slugs. And once you're using it, make sure you have your protective gears on when you are applying whatever the chemical might be. Now, someone is asking about uh, meningitis and um, the effects of it. I think now there are different types of meningitis. Now, I'm not no doctor, but I'm just saying there are different types. There's bacterial meningitis where you get the swelling and things like that. This is just a different type of meningitis. It is esophilic meningitis. That's the correct terminology, right? So what will happen is, let's say you do consume it, the snail, you will get a type of fever, you will get um, chills and things like that, but it will not kill you, but still it will get you sick. So you are not supposed to be consuming giant African snail. If it is even a small garden that you have, you can still buy a, a packet or a bottle of this bait and you can actually set it up 
on the borders of your property so you can still get rid of the snail because i'm saying to you if you let's say you come out usually snails are active more when it's cooler times of the day so later in the evening into the night and early morning as well if you come out in the evening and you see one giant african snail you destroy that snail because remember that one snail is going to produce 400 eggs or up to 1200 eggs so once you see if it's one snail you get rid of it once it's a giant african snail whether it's a small plot that you have or large acreages of land and yes i'm seeing other people talk about yeah they are fed up i'm i know and i feel your pain because i've visited a number of fields many officers as well and we have seen overnight acres upon acres of cucumber and pumpkin even okra has been destroyed by the number of giant african snails so yes it is very costly when you have this this um, problem but you can't just say that you're just going to leave it like that leaving it like that means it's just going to multiply even more start little by little baiting small areas at a time and you will reduce the population like with everything once you bring it to a very low level you're able to manage the problem now in terms of the ratios and things like that like i mentioned it's two cups of salt to a gallon of water or two cups of bleach to a gallon of water right and this presentation will be posted up um, by tomorrow i think so that you can refer back to it to get the rates and things like that with regards to the bait usually they will tell you the directions on the packet so you use it as as they um, recommend Now I'm not um, too familiar. Now we we are in Ministry of Agriculture, yes, but we deal with Trinidad, so I'm not too sure about Tobago, if they do have it or what are the concerns there. But apart in Trinidad, I, what I can speak about Trinidad, generally almost every area has it, right? You may not be seeing it in your area, which is count your blessings, but that doesn't mean it is not there. You need to still look out for it, right? Come out at night or dust when the places are cool and you may find them actually coming out and feeding. Now that's it. Now someone is asking about if you bait the area, if it will work for um, local snails and our um, giant African snail. That's the risk that we have to take because if our local snails does feed on this bait, it also kills it. Right, so that's something we really can't do too much of right now because of how how devastating this giant African snail is. Now we have when we talk about people talk about natural enemies and things like that. Yes, you have birds and you have rodents that feed on this snail. But when you look at the numbers of rodents and birds as compared to the number of snails, it far outweighs each other. So that is why. So they are still in the environment trying to control the population, but it's still too much. That is why as humans, we have to try our best to control it as well. All right, so like I said, thanks very much for tuning on to us today and continue to um, tune into our sessions. Every Tuesday from 12 noon, we have different topics to show you and to highlight some of the things that the ministry is doing. I know a lot of people give the ministry a bad name that we do nothing, but I'm sure from these presentations, you can actually see the amount of work that goes into um, what we do. Sometimes we have resources where we can do things, others we, other times we don't. For instance, a lot of those presentations that we are presenting from the research division, you are seeing a number of pests that we have been talking about that are actually in the Caribbean, very close to us, and we are putting things in place to prevent it from getting into our country, right? We are doing surveys and things like that. So it takes a lot of time, a lot of manpower, and also money to do these things. That is why we have to actually pool our resources to do other things as compared to actually managing giant African snail, because we have tried to eradicate it, like I said before, it didn't happen so what we need to do now is manage it and in order for that to happen like i said it has to be a team effort we are giving you the correct information like i said before all we are asking you to get together and start in your area that's all apply these measures in your area and you will see a reduction in your um, snail population thank you very much and have a safe day